From this panel, we had uh, real looks at the importance that uh, research will have as we go on in the future. There was some confidence that the public is now more mature in its expectations of research results. Uh, but people thought that this could make uh, the acceptability of research results both easier and more difficult because there is a wider range of expectations. Uh, the, there was a lot, there was some good audience response from the idea that some of this ought to be able to be hurried up, but the rest of the panel thought not at all. So, um, as I say, it was a good panel. They had lots of really fresh and feisty ideas, and I think, again, we should give them another round of... They don't win the prize for getting off the stage the quickest, but they do. <laughs> very, very good. Okay, so for our next panel is on CRISPR. Uh, so I would like to ask Louise to get her panel to move up um, onto the, as you'll notice, we don't get coffee breaks in this place. Uh, there's coffee and water out there and you go quietly. The uh, previous panel talked a little bit about CRISPR. I think if you'd been here four years ago, you would notice that most people look rather baffled when CRISPR was mentioned. Are they talking about a new characteristic of lettuce? Uh, CRISPR and better. Uh, but as the years have gone by, there's much more knowledge. I think this panel will still have to do a little bit of explaining about what CRISPR actually is, but there's a great deal more knowledge than there was uh, a few years ago, and this conference has had uh, a good deal to do with that. You've got really good people to talk about this this afternoon. Again, let me remind you that if you go to the website, you will get the full website, the full background of this very impressive group. The moderator is Louise Fresco. She's the president of Wageningen University, um, one of the best agricultural universities in the world. I want to stay friends with uh, uh, the, the heads of all of them, so therefore, one, is one okay? <laughs> but she's also the background, she also, and, uh, just like our last university president, she finds running a university presidency so easy that she's written a number of books, fiction and nonfiction, and she's written a wonderful one called Hamburgers in Paradise. Now, if the title of that alone doesn't make you go out and buy it, nothing should. It's a a really good, well-read, well-written, very witty book. Uh, Greg Jaffa has worked on biosafety issues in the United States, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ghana, Malawi, Ethiopia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Nigeria. So he has a very wide comparative experience that he can bring to us. Uh, very interesting. Before that, he was a trial attorney. Isn't that interesting? Yes. In the U.S. DOJ Department of Justice and as a senior counsel for the EPA. So uh, that's an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting combination. I won't make any jokes about that at all. Uh, Dr. Dan Wojtek is the chief scientist of official for the co-founder of Calixt, Calixt uh, a, a consumer-centric food and agriculture-focused company. Uh, he co-invented the Talon technology, which is one of the premier gene editing platforms. And Ren Wang, hi Ren, haven't seen you for years. Uh, Ren Wang is the special advisor to the chairman of BGI in the world's largest genomic organization. He guides them in the Interior Cooperation and Agriculture Initiative, and he is obviously from China and an important advisor to many Chinese authorities. So, Louise, good luck. Thank you, Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to present this uh, panel to you. Given the time frame and given the importance of the subject, uh, we're really going to focus on the substance, and there will be ample time for all of you to uh, ask questions and enter in debate. Just um, a few words on why we wanted to have this panel. And I actually had to twist Ken, uh, Ken's arm a little bit to have this panel and to have it today. The reason is that we don't want to particularly talk about CRISPR-Cas um, or more broadly, new breeding techniques or precision breeding, because I think the importance of that 
uh, and its potential is very clear to all of you. I guess you, all of you know more or less what we're talking about. So we're not going to go so much into the genetics, but we're going into the question of how we can make sure that internationally we have a regulatory regime, given all the differences that we have now between countries, that actually allows us to address the pressing issues of today, the issues of drought, the issues of hunger, the issues of accessibility for small countries, small producers, poor consumers, and so on. Now, I had already had this panel in mind when on the 25th of July, the European Court of Justice uh, gave its verdict on uh, CRISPR-Cas or new breeding techniques or mutagenesis or what have you, basically saying that um, all products derived that way would fall under the GMO regulation. And that, um, for us in Europe, but also for the rest of the world, uh, came really as a thunderbolt because it means entering into a game of enormous regulatory complications and it really blocks a lot of the progress. So needless to say that we as scientists in Europe are very worried about this, even not just as scientists, but I'm proud to say that our students in plant breeding at Wageningen have now mobilized their counterparts at European universities and have said, don't limit our current generation of new breeders, read new Norman Borlows, by regulation when lawyers decide on things that were the public, let alone the public that is at stake, that has a stake in the future, the younger generations have not been heard, something is really wrong. So that's where we stand now in a world where the American uh, rules and regulations are quite different from the ones in the rest of the world, quite different from the ones in Europe. I, our aim today is not to accuse or vilify people, but to ask ourselves, what's the best way forward? And I think you will find that our basic bottom line here is optimistic. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to our first um, introductory speaker, Greg, who gives us um, a little bit a painting of the whole landscape. So Greg, go ahead. So thank you, Louise, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I am the token lawyer on the panel, and you can't really have a lawyer. You can't talk about regulations with having at least one lawyer on the panel. Um, and I am sort of spent uh, many years of my life following the legal issues around biosafety and around GMOs, and been following the issues around gene editing. So in the next couple of minutes, what I thought I'd give you some observations about the debate that's been going on about the regulation of gene edited uh, agricultural products. And the real, it really comes down to one question that's being asked by many of the different stakeholders and regulators. And the question is, is a gene edited product a GMO or not? Um, if it is a GMO, then it's regulated like a GMO. And if not, then it's not regulated. And we can talk about whether that's the right question, but that is the question that's really being asked by a lot of the stakeholders around the world. Um, and in deciding whether the uh, gene edited product is a GMO or not, there are sort of three different criteria that people are using uh, to make that distinction. One is whether there's any foreign DNA or a transgene in the final product. So this means that you know, DNA from one species has been introduced into the other species with the gene editing. Um, so that's been one criteria that some, some people are thinking should be the criteria in making the decision of whether it's regulated or not. Um, a second one is whether the edit could be found in nature. Um, and the best way to describe that is that the edited crop or animal variety sort of mimics and copies an existing genetic sequence that already exists in that crop or animal's population. So it, that's the second one. And the third one that people are using is whether the gene editing could have been produced through conventional breeding, such as mutagenesis or irradiation. And this sort of means that the genetic change could have been produced with another method but it's being done here for gene editing because it's either quicker or more precise, or there's a reason to do it there, but it could happen by one of what we would call traditional methods. And so that's sort of the three criteria that different countries or different stakeholders are saying should be the way that we decide whether something gets regulated. So far, most of the countries around the world have not publicly stated whether they will regulate gene edited crops, and if so, how they're gonna regulate them. So I think you know, this is, what we're talking about here today hasn't been decided by most countries. But there are a few who have made public pronouncements about it. And what I can describe those best is by saying that they form a spectrum. So you know, on one hand, we have countries like the United States, 
whose initial policy pronouncements suggest that the same laws that have been applied to GMOs will be applied to gene-edited agricultural products. What does this mean in practice? So today, there are three different laws that are applied in the United States to GMOs, and some GMOs are regulated and some aren't regulated. And similarly, those same three laws will be applied to gene-edited products, and some of those will be regulated and some of them will not be regulated. Um, so that's one category of countries. Um, we have some countries such as Israel and Argentina, and those countries have, have made that, taken the determination based on that foreign, foreign DNA uh, that I mentioned earlier. So they've said, if the final product doesn't have any foreign DNA, then we're not going to treat it as a GMO, we're not going to regulate it. And that's done on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's their decision. Um, and then we have, as, as Louise said, we have the European Union, but the European Union is not the only one. A New Zealand court also said that they looked at the definition of the GMO in the, of a GMO in the statute and regulations, and they said that gene editing fell within it. So we have not just the European Union, but, and that, so that means that all products that are gene edited will be treated just like a GMO and go through that regulation. You know, I would say that it's unlikely, given the, the 200 plus countries we have around the world, that we're gonna have harmonization and everybody's gonna come to the same decision. And I think, especially in the short term, that's clearly not gonna be the case. And we can talk on this panel about some of the implications of that. Um, so moving forward, I think the detail, the devil is really going to be in the details. And, and the regulatory system that we discuss is gonna be nuanced, which we know is difficult. Um, but these differences in the regulatory systems will cause obstacles to the broad adoption of gene edited crops. And I'll just give a couple of examples. They may cause trade disruptions. They can lead to market segmentation. Um, but they're also more importantly gonna confuse consumers about whether these things are safe or not, no matter which regulatory system you have. No regulation, consumers say, you know, why isn't it being regulated? Is it safe? Too much regulation? Oh, it must not be safe. Why it needs all that regulation? So, you know, getting that balance right is, is really gonna be important. So, you know, I think our challenge here today on this panel and as we move forward with this is sort of to think outside the box. Um, I'm gonna say this, you know, I don't think regulation is a dirty word um, and it has its value and it can, it will ensure safety and also help as a side benefit, help secure consumer acceptance. If it's done properly, it can establish the pathway to market, um, which is good for investment and for trade um, but if it's not done properly, it can stifle and prevent the adoption of this technology. So how do we establish a risk and science-based regulatory system that's fair and functional? Can we establish that, that risk-based proportionate regulatory system that makes those distinctions among the different kinds of gene-edited products that might be out there, some of which will mimic like transgenics and some of which will mimic conventional breeding? Um, and that really is, I think, um, and how do we get those to market without delays without delays to the products that farmers need and at the same time getting consumer acceptance. So I think that's our challenge to get the regulators, the lawyers, all the different stakeholders together and be more creative and figure out what can work. And Thank I'll you. leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. As you know, lawyers always um, have lots of words to explain things, <laughs> but they also have very complicated things to explain. Thank you. That was a great contribution. Um, Danny. Yes, so I guess I'm a practitioner of, of gene editing and have been for some time. So I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota uh, where I've been working on gene editing um, and developing new technologies and new approaches. As was mentioned, we developed the Talon technology in collaboration with colleagues just up the road at, at Iowa State University. Um, my lab at the university now practices CRISPR-Cas, also trying to implement it in plants for, for plant agriculture. Um, but early on, I, I realized that clearly this technology has, you know, real-world applications that can provide benefit. And so I formed a company called Calix, which was using, the goal was to use gene editing really to produce healthier foods. Um, and that company has been around uh, for eight years now, and we have our first uh, product that's going to market this year. We believe it's probably the first gene-edited crop to enter the food supply. Um, this is a soybean variety that produces a healthier oil. It's free from trans fats, and it has a fatty acid composition more akin to olive oil or canola oil. And so we are harvesting right now 17,000 acres of that product. Um, we're contracting with farmers and crushing the seed and hoping to sell the oil. And so it's through my experience at the company that I came to appreciate the impact that regulatory policy can have on new technology and bringing it 
uh, to bear to solve uh, real world problems. So we went to the USDA um, in the early days and brought our gene edited products to them to, to find out how they would regulate it. Um, and it didn't have a transgene, it didn't have a pest foreign pest, plant pest or sequence within the genome. And, and, and really they concluded that it was no different than an outcome that could be created through sort of traditional mutagenesis, unregulated processes. So they gave us the go ahead to plant our products out into the field and, and see how they performed. Now that we have a product that's going to market, we're talking to the FDA to make sure that the, the food that we're developing, the food ingredient that we're developing, will have no harmful consequences. So the existing regulatory policy really carefully scrutinized um, the products that we're making and to ensure that they're, that they're safe for consumption and for the environment. But when I circle back and think about my colleagues at academia, it's there that I'm now starting to see the impact of regulatory policy. Um, after the European court decision, my inbox was flooded with emails expressing dismay by my European colleagues that, you know, are they going to be able to receive governmental support for their research? Um, there's the possibilities for industries and companies like the one I created here might no longer be possible uh, in, in Europe. And so there was a lot of frustration there. And then also, um, we're not just developing uh, healthier food ingredients for the US market. In my academic lab, we've made varieties of cassava um, that could increase yield and reduce labor in Africa. We've uh, viral re virus resistant lines of rice that could be deployed um, in East Asia. Uh, one of my graduate students is in the audience. She is the daughter of an Ethiopian farmer who grew teff. And she is working at, so this is a staple grain of of, of Eastern Africa, and she wants to use gene editing to improve TEF um, so that yields can be increased um, and you know, the people of Ethiopia can realize a larger harvest. But can we deploy these technologies? Right now, those products are, and the, and the products we've created are sitting on the shelf waiting for some regulatory guidance to how to get them out into the field, out to the farmers, um, and to solve some of these real world problems. So, so my big concern about not having harmony global harmony in regulatory policy is that uh, the technology really is not going to be utilized to its full benefit and full potential to solve uh, issues of food security. Yeah, thank you for this very um, practical sort of view of things. And, and I think here in the audience, we are, of course, particularly concerned with the fact that um, most, if not all, African countries have very little regulation. And for them to all of them develop that by themselves and have the capacity uh, to actually also monitor that is going to be a hugely time-consuming issue. So having some kind of format for regulation might be very well something we want to move towards. But before I take um, uh, more of the floor, I think, Ren, your experience in China is particularly interesting. So tell us what to expect from China, how does it work, what are your views on, on the global stage? Thank you very much, uh, Luis. And first of all, let me take this opportunity to, to say a few words of, of uh, my appreciation, really, to uh, Ambassador Ken Queen and also the foundation of the World Food Prize for bringing me here. It's uh, really wonderful to be back to this very inspiring event. Now, um, when Luis asked me to join this panel, I said, well, one condition is that I, I would not speak on behalf of uh, the Chinese government, nor on behalf of uh, FAO, which I served for five years before I return to China. So with that, let me say that, uh, okay, uh, the, the development of, uh, uh, let's say, products and services of biotechnologies, uh, particularly transgenics, GMOs, and now on our topic of the gene editing is very, very interesting in China. But I have to say that uh, maybe disappointing to many of the colleagues who are interested in knowing what's going on in China, First thing I have to say is that there has been no development, no progress in terms of government approval for the application or commercial application of transgenics, let alone gene editing, let's say, uh, products and services derived from CRISPR technologies. Okay, now in China, uh, now the people believe, let's say the research community believe that there is a quite a strong tendency that the uh, products derived from CRISPR technologies, let's say gene editing, will be categorized 
same as GMOs, let's say transgenic crops, which is rather disappointing from my point of view. However, I wanted to share maybe three uh, my observations on the trends of uh, uh, development of CRISPR, uh, R&Ds in CRISPR technology in China. One is that a very, very rapid decline of the cost of genome sequencing in China, associated with development of sequencers and even DNA synthesizers. Now, as we all recall, that probably in late 2001, when the President of the United States, together with Prime Minister of the UK, announced the completion of the first human genome, that was at a cost of three and a half billion dollars after 13 years of research in a partnership of, of six or seven countries, right? And that was a really vivid memory. Now, this year, uh, the company Illumina in the U.S., together with the BGI, announced the uh, sequencing of one personal genome, complete human genome, is at a cost of $600. And you can do it in two days. And now the new machine, new sequencers, can complete 60, 60 human genome in two days, and analyze the analysis can be completed in two hours. No, this is much more than the more law of IT tech industries. So as you can see, we are now moving into a new era when we can think the sequencing cost is almost negligible, right? And then what do we do? That's one. And second observation is actually very much reflecting what we heard from Secretary Dan Glickman of our previous panel. There's the interaction and reference with the medical science and the rapid development and even you know, deliberations by the government even in China for therapeutic applications of these genetic tools and products, including genetic screening, sequencing, application of sequencing, okay? and even through the use of CASPERS. Um, now they are rapid development moving into government applications for approval for Parkinson's disease, for Heimer's diseases, and also beta type uh, thalassemia. And all of these are moving rapidly. So that, I think, will have a profound impact, actually accelerating the considerations on crops and livestock. Now, the third observation is a very strong trend, is that as, as, as I see it, there is a whole new generation of scientists, young, dynamic, and uh, very capable of using the most modern technologies and, and research tools in China in collaborations and partnerships with uh, universities and uh, institutions, private companies around the world, working on this gene editing. A whole range of crops are popping up, as well as like creating sort of mini pigs for experimental and even for pet purposes, and, and also medical, again, of genetic diseases as well as infectious diseases and cancer. So there's a whole generation of new scientists is really the place where we see hope. So all of these three, as I see it, is forming into such a strong kind of a trend that will impact on, let's say, the approval, hopefully, by the Chinese government on the uh, uh, commercial application in the future of not only CRISPR-Cas products, but also transgenics. Now, let me also quickly mention two concerns that I have also. One is actually an obvious missing or lack of adequate public education about this new technology. Although the science is developing, scientists, new, new generation of scientists are there, making a lot of scientific publications, but public gen, you know, opinions, which will strongly influence the government policies, is still very much weak. And secondly, is perhaps not only China, but in many other countries, as we see, is the ministries in China, in the Chinese government machinery, that actually will have a say, or policymakers on the approvals, don't talk to each other. The Ministry of, Edu Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs not necessarily consult with the State Commission on Health, for instance, about the approval and the, and the evaluation of genetic, uh, let's say, therapeutic uh, medicines and tools and technologies. So this is really worrying. I'll stop there.
Thank you, Ren. I think some of these issues actually are quite recognizable to, to many countries, certainly some of your last points, but also in general. Um, I think there is a younger generation of scientists uh, that is uh, far less, even in Europe, far less fearful of progress and of science and technology. Now, um, maybe just one quick reaction, um, not on everybody, on everybody, but Greg, do you want to react to anything that has been said? No, I, just, I think that we've I think what we've all sort of said, and I think what's important is um, that the regulatory landscape out there is really uncertain. And what uncertainty does is prevent products from getting to the market. As Dan mentioned, there are things in the lab and that we could be used in Africa, but it's not that they're over-regulated or under-regulated, but nobody even knows what the regulation is. And until you do that, you know, it's a non-answer, ends up being a no answer. So I think that's something to just keep in mind yeah. Yeah. that um, um, the longer we wait to have this discussion, and make some decisions, that ends up being a default no to a large extent. Yeah, absolutely. Anything from your side, Dan? Yeah, I mean, one, th one question that often comes up is, how do you know that you haven't done something else to the genome in your editing and that you know, you've created something um, that could possibly be harmful? Um, and to get to Ren's point is we now have really powerful analytical tools if we edit a plant's genome, we can sequence it and say, well, we actually only made that precise modification to the genome. Or, you know, if, if that gene modification changes fatty acid composition, we can analyze that uh, and make sure that it, you know, it, there's nothing harmful there. So I think we have tools and technologies to ensure that the products we create are safe. That, that may be a kind of guarantee. Any comments from your side, Ren, yeah, for a moment? I'll just make one more comment. That is this is the role of the private sector. Since I now left the public sector and joined sort of private sector, which is from my new experience. But I see uh, there are private sector companies who are not necessarily for the purpose of making money to develop and the applications of CRISPR technologies. I, I'm quite uh, encouraging, actually that they are really driving down, through competition actually, driving down the cost of sequencing and also uh, synthesis, synthesis, synthetic biology. Now there's such a trend, so I see positively. A corollary of what you say is that when we work on public outreach and building public support, the private sector has to be part and parcel of that. Public outreach cannot just be a government issue. Okay, time has come to open up for questions and comments. Now, in order to give everybody a chance, it's really going to be important that you be brief and that you concentrate on a question rather than on a statement. So I see Ismail Sirageldin running to the, to the microphone. Can I have a show of hands uh, of other questions or have you been? Yeah, I'm looking at the slide. Okay, queue up and speak. Ismail first. Uh, thank you, Louise. I just have three uh, quick questions to the panel. Number one is we just finished a major study for the National Academy of Science on human genome editing. Under what circumstances should it be allowed? And uh, there the guidelines are for the research labs and so on, and for applications to humans. But nevertheless, in the preparation of that, which took about a, a year and a half, we were concerned about the appearance of indels, which are unwanted inserts and deletions that occur along with CRISPR. Secondly, there has been a, a, how shall I say this, a discovery that in fact, because CRISPR has become so easy and so inexpensive, I mean the average cost is about $200 for a whole kit, including your guide RNA, which you can get on the internet. There's a lot of do-it-yourself young people which are reminiscent of hackers who would take their laptops and sit in, in coffee shops. And uh, they do things and experiment on themselves. They experiment on each other with like they would with drugs. So that this is not going to be contained in that side. And maybe, here's the question to the lawyer, we need a different sort of mechanism as the telephones have allowed for apps and for people to design apps for the uh, iPhone or for the, the Samsung or for whatever, and then get somehow uh, acceptance on some of these things. And uh, I think that therefore that requires thinking outside of the box in both cases. Thank you very much. 
Next, we were going to collect a couple of questions and then let the panel react. Next question. I can hardly see you, so you have to speak up who you are because. Uh, Hi, Louise. Teacher it's name. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Kent from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, my question for the panel, and, and maybe starting with Greg, but if others have comments, is about the possibility of developing model regulations and model laws. I think our experience with GMOs was that some very um, toxic model legislation and model laws were developed through Cartagena, through the African Union and others that really sort of set the baseline in a, in a, in a bad way. Um, and currently, as you described it, we're facing a, somewhat a regulatory void when it comes to gene edited products. Uh, and a, a void is dangerous because others might come in with model rules and regulations that really are um, designed to block the technology transfer. Is any, are any of you aware of any efforts to develop model laws or regulations, perhaps drawing on some of the Australian expertise? Thank you. Well, in fact, one could say that the European Court of Justice has stepped into a void already. Um, any other comments, on questions? This side. Oh, on this side, yes. Go ahead. Thompson, Michigan State. Quick question. If you have an event that's really clean, that's something that could happen in nature, what's the plan to regulate something you can't detect? Absolutely fantastic question. Thank you. Next. Hi, Pedro Sanchez. I'm not a geneticist at all. But I'm getting sick and tired of fears that have been proven wrong by, by many uh, years of uh, safety and observation that still impede Africans to, uh, to have the advantages of GMOs. And now with this new technology, it seems to be uh, judged that it needs a lot of, that it needs a lot of safety. Uh, at the same time, looking at the, uh, and the medical, uh, the medical science, they use, they have used GMOs uh, for a long time. So we don't want GMOs, or some of us don't want GMOs in our food, but we sure have them in our medicine. I think the whole thing is getting a bit ridiculous. It's been a long, long time, and I hope, and I hope that the world can come to grips with this finally. Well. I guess um, you hear from the applause, we, many people agree, but the trouble is it's more than just an issue of language, it's an issue of emotion, and emotions usually don't go away like that. Next question, please. Hello, how you doing? My name is Jorge, I'm from Alabama, and um, I'm part of a farmer community. And my question is, with GMO um, well, uh, crops, can the seeds be uh, used for the next harvest? Because I know I heard like, yes, it can, but after, if you keep using the seeds, they might not uh, produce well. And after each harvest, you need to get new seeds. So I want to know if you can't re reuse the seeds from that crop, how do you keep getting uh, more seeds and that efficient to keep buying new seeds instead of using the ones that you just grew? Thank you. Yes, this also raises the issue of hybrid seed, for example. We'll get them to reply to that in a few minutes. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Jay Evan McGee. I'm from uh, Minnesota here. Um, my question to you guys was, what can we, the younger generation, do to get uh, these genetically modified organisms to be better understood by the public? I think there's a lot of skepticism between the less educated areas on GMOs. Yeah, thank you. Very relevant question. I go back to the others. We don't have anybody in the middle there. So. Um, Can you hear me? Yep, there we go. OK. Um, my name is Mark G, student at Purdue University. And I was wondering, what would your response be to someone who says, food security is not an issue in the United States and Europe. Medical issues are, therefore, we need CRISPR in medical technology, but not in food research. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to get the panel to give a very quick reaction. Uh, just select me one or two questions so that we can have another round with the, um, uh, the audience. And for the next questions, I want women to start asking questions. <laughs> I mean, what's happening here? The room is half full of women, and we only have men asking questions? I cannot tolerate that as a... Uh, Chair. 
Good. Um, I'm starting with uh, I'm starting with Ren. Ren, any comments from your side? Uh, yeah, I wanted to pick up I wanted to pick up the comment or question uh, about this model laws or, or model sort of a, you know regulations. Uh, of course, there are commonalities, right? There are common concerns and considerations. Uh, let's say for developing the uh, methods and uh, regulations for evaluations of these products. However, you have to consider this is country specific, right? This is, this is countries are different. They have different legislation systems, different culture, and so on. So there is that concern. Nevertheless, let me just uh, share with you uh, one interesting sort of lesson that we, in China, we learned uh, when the, uh, let's say, uh, the research community particularly uh, has been very much frustrated by the lack of development or lack of progress in uh, approval, government approval, legislation approval for the commercialization of, of uh, GMOs, let's say transgenic. And one big lesson that, uh, that was really uh, written by quite a few people on public media was the, uh, the, the split, let's say, between scientists and public. And there was uh, basically no uh, campaign or let's say no effort of media for educating the general public about the GMOs. So when a scientist pre presented strong evidence and so on, which convinced the ministries to have quickly released the approval for the environmental release of commercial, I mean the transgenic crops. And there was a strong opposing sort of opinion from the general public. So now, the science, science community in China have been saying in conferences, again, on, not on general public media, that we should learn that lesson. And they also quoted, actually, the experience from the United States. I leave it to you to judge whether it's true. They said, well, the one big reason for the United States of America being able to, let's say, commercialize its transgenic crops was the advanced public education. Well, that was something quoted from the Chinese media. So now the scientific community is saying that we should make effort now in anticipation of the uh, availability of uh, gene edited products and services. That I want to make emphasis. Dan, at least you have one question to reply to. Just a few of the science questions, yeah. I guess. So, I mean, one of the first ones was, you know, where do you draw the boundary in human gene editing? And in generally, it's um, you limit it to the somatic cells. You don't edit the germline so you can pass the change to the next generation. So if you have cystic fibrosis, you try to edit the cells of the lung to cure the disease. But in contrast, in plants, we try to make a stable, heritable modification and that would be transmitted from one generation to the next. And so you could, in fact, grow the seeds over multiple generations. I mean, there are, as you mentioned, hybrid systems wherein the progeny of the hybrids over multiple generations may not behave as the parents did, but that's an inherent you know, problem in planting the progeny of a hybrid, and it would, it would persist if you also had a gene-edited hybrid. Um, and then the final question that I will address is the one concerning how do you distinguish an edit from natural variation? Um, and I think you know, the USDA has is, is proposed that, well, if you move, let's say you have a a disease, uh, a disease resistance allele that confers, uh, in potato that confers blight resistance. And you could edit cultivated potato to have that same genetic variation. You could cross it in also to create a cultivated potato with that same genetic variation. So really the two outcomes are, are very similar. And so in some cases, it is not distinguishable. Thank you, Dan. Greg. So um, I'm going to try to quickly answer a number of different questions. So Ismail's question about the uh, DIY young people and, and how do you regulate that. And that's why I think we need to think about regulation more creatively. So we think of regulation usually as a product developer going to the government and things like that. But there are other kinds of regulation. There could be codes of conduct. So we could have you know general codes of conduct that DIY labs and others used on how to properly um, use this technology, what are, what's in bounds and what's aren't bounds, what are the best practices types of things. Um, we could also have um, you know, li licensing things. So when you get the kit from the, because even DIY people are still gonna get their sequences 
somewhere or something like that, that with that, that comes some, some licensing, some agreement to use it in a certain fashion and, and not to do human testing on it or something like that. So, I mean, if somebody wants to violate and, and do something illegal, they're going to do it anyway, even the laws don't prevent that. But I think we have to think more creatively, potentially, on how do we oversee this and think about it as overseeing than just regulation necessarily. So that's a question there. To Lawrence's question about uh, developing model laws or provisions, I'm not aware of anybody's doing that now for gene editing around the world. I think there's st most of the stakeholders are still in this battle of is it a GMO, not a GMO, as opposed to let's sit down and think about what is the proper type of oversight that might be needed here. My take with uh, experience from models in the GMO context is, I mean, I think the problem with a, a very prescriptive model law is a lot of countries want their own sovereignty, and so they want to change that. And their changing of that sometimes can be more stringent, sometimes can be less, but they don't want to just adopt something. They somehow think if we adopted it, we're t sort of, we haven't put our own thought process into it. So I'm not sure I'm in favor of a whole model law or things, but I think clearly an outline and clearly some of the key provisions about what we're going to do and where, where the buckets are for the different kinds of things would be important. Um, in terms of regulating something where we can't detect it, that is true, and that becomes an enforcement issue, but we do have laws that do regulate intent. So pesticide is defined in the United States as something that's intended to kill a pest. There are lots of things that are, could kill a pest that aren't pesticides and don't need to be registered because they're not intended to be. And similarly, food is intended as something that to, to be eaten. So we do have laws that talk about intent. And so could we design a law that talked about the intent? You know, if you, if you intentionally edited something, even if you couldn't detect it, that could be regulated, we could. There are enforcement issues around it. I'm not suggesting we do it, but as a theoretical matter and as a legal matter, one can do that in it. Whether that's the right thing to do, that's what we need that discussion. And finally, just about the question about sort of the medicine dilemma. I think, you know, what's interesting about the CRISPR debate is that, you know, what happens in the medicine will, could greatly impact what people's perceptions are in agriculture. If we do some things like, you know, cure uh, fibrosis or deal with sick and sickle cell anemia, that might pave the way for people to be much more open about gene editing in agriculture when they weren't in, in, in GMO. So I think, you know, we want to, these things are being developed simultaneously. And I think the public actually has more, uh, gets more in the press about CRISPR with medicine. And so to some extent, how they feel how that works, positively and negatively, could affect how it affects agriculture. Thank you. Yeah, very useful. Um, I have room for two really brief questions. So dash to the microphone, ladies only. <laughs> going to be really strict with you guys. And ladies have to run also. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering in a time of still strong prevalence of religion, how that plays a role in public perspectives of genomic editing and how that can be combated in media or policy um, or even just as scientists. Yeah, thank you. Clear question. We'll take it. Second question. Second question. Oh, well, uh, Florence Wambogo, Africa yeah, Harvest. Africa. You know, the you word gene a editing. Bit more into microphone, please. Okay, the word gene editing itself creates the background of GMO. Just because you are saying gene editing, you are literally telling the story that you are editing some genes and that creates that, that whole story about there is something need to be regulated. But if you look at the experience of GMOs in Africa, um, Africa look at what's happening in Europe, but if Europe have said it's going to be GMO, the African countries are going to look at it in the same way. And so we have to figure out, most important is education, information, just as companies are investing in um, new research, and I think there should be really basically what was being discussed, the outreach, extension, information. If you're coming with a new product, I think you can't escape to educate, to inform the consumers and the farmers. It, we have you. to invest Thank in the same. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. I have one very, very last question on the other side. I thought, okay. or? So Barbara from Uganda. Derek. Yeah. Uh, I've been listening and I'm worried because we are already struggling to get the what we call the biosafety laws in place in Africa. And uh, now we are talking of other regulations for 
CRISPR-Cas or the gene editing. So I'm wondering if we are going to go through the same process, aren't we going again to miss a lot about this technology? Why don't we find alternative ways of regulation instead of asking for new model laws or laws to be considered for this technology? So I want to agree with Florence. Maybe what we need is to educate more the populations and to be clear on which will be regulated and which ones are almost natural and look like natural that we don't need to regulate them. Thank you. Thank you very much. All very relevant questions. So my panel gets exactly one minute and you have to look at the clock to get one minute a person um, to reply to whatever question comes to mind. Um, I'll start with Dan. Yeah, so a few of the questions concern sort of public acceptance or how do we get the public to embrace the technology. And I think if you look at the first wave of biotechnology, we made it traits that benefited the farmer, herbicide tolerance, insect, pest and pathogen resistance, which is a little bit of a disconnect from the consumer. So, but if you make a, you know, uh, a healthier cooking oil or a reduced gluten wheat or products that the consumer can see a direct health benefit to, I think that in part could help accept, people could connect to the technology and, and maybe um, accept it more willingly. Good, thank you very much. Ren? Uh, thank you, I wanna make uh, quickly one point again, that is uh, the uh, looking to the future. My suggestion really is for the governments and also even public to really pay attention to the capacity development, to, to uh, nurturing and developing uh, the next generation of scientists who can not only research, but also the uh, application, the use of uh, uh, gene editing technologies, especially for developing countries. Uh, here, let me just make one minute advocacy for this wonderful initiative uh, called African Orphan Crops Consortium, which was initiated actually by American uh, scientists and together with the International, uh, the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi. And uh, their starting point uh, are two, actually. One is to sequence all of these more than 100 uh, orphan crops uh, which are used uh, in Africa. And secondly is the nurturing and development of a new generation of plant breeders. So that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Greg, last um, but sorry, not least. Answer, uh, to, I'm going to try to respond to Barbara's question. I mean, ideally, we shouldn't be writing a law for each new, new technique or technology, a GMO law, because if we do write that, I mean, then we write a law for gene editing, and now five years from now, we're going to have some new technique, some new technology. So we should write, if, if we're going to write any law at all and have oversight, it should be either you know, a product-specific thing, we're looking at food kind of thing, with a technology provision, with giving the... Uh, giving the discretion to the regulator to figure out which of the products that have different new technologies need oversight at all and what that oversight should be. Because we clearly don't want to keep going back to our parliaments or congresses every four or five years for every new technology that comes along. It's not efficient and it's really going to hold things back. So the better thing would be to have some broader umbrella and give discretion to the regulators to figure out which, tech not tech, which products have risks that need any oversight at all. Thank you. Um, I think we had a fantastic panel. And let me just um, share with you a few ideas that I retain. Um, obviously, this is the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to be said. I think the first conclusion is we are in a regulatory void. There are very few countries that have actually regulated something. And the whole question is how much regulation is needed to make sure not only that on the one hand science can go forward and find solutions for all these pressing issues, but on the other hand the public is comfortable that it's not being exposed to undue risks. The longer this void continues, the more uncertainty there is with the public, the more risk there is that companies feel uncomfortable, that governments don't know what to do, and that is really a serious situation. So I want you to go home with a sense of urgency there. This is not something that can be left alone for ages. Not regulating means, in fact, also regulating, but regulating in the wrong way, based on uh, prejudice, based on misconception, based on all kinds of things that actually will hamper not only science or public acceptance, but also things like trade flows. So that's one, I think, important conclusion. The other one is that it all hinges on 
public acceptance and that we should not fall into the trap of the mistakes that we have made with GMOs. Uh, mistakes that have to do with not explaining enough, and I think we scientists have also been guilty in some ways for remaining too long in our ivory to towers and not communicating sufficiently. Now here's the last most important comment, and that is we end on a note of optimism because there is a huge new generation of plant breeders, of geneticists, of scientists, of lawyers, of economists who really see the importance of moving forward, who see the need not just to work in their own countries but also in other countries. And they will want to move. They don't want to stop. And they need to have the tools and the means to do it but also the security of some kind of agreement, and it doesn't need to be a legal regulatory framework, but some kind of agreement between governments and countries, including the private sector and NGOs, that we can move forward and that we can put into practice that wonderful experience that we now have, that we can do something with far more precision and far more accuracy than any other generation has been able to do before us. So on that positive note, I want you to thank my panel and go away and think about it. Thank you very much. Wasn't that a